Really want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Apologize for the late for the late start, but um, uh, it is our privilege uh, at San Antonio Christian School to come alongside uh, our families, our parents. Uh, and as you guys know, because I think that's the reason that you sought out San Antonio Christian School, uh, God gives to moms and dads the privilege, but the awesome task of being the primary teachers and mentors of their children. We have the awesome privilege and responsibility of being able to come alongside you. And while your kids are here with us during the school day, as you entrust them into our care, we're in a way... Um, in the place of you as parents. <clears throat> but we always remember that what we're about is that we're in partnership with you as parents. And we want this school um, and everything that we do here to be an extension of your home, your faith community, so that these children, and I guess if you've read some of my emails, we've described them as God's heritage uh, from Psalm 127, that we would be able to raise up our kids uh, according to the design, the bent that he has for each one of them. And the cool thing is, is even though this is a mighty and awesome and terrifying prospect uh, to be a warrior uh, on behalf of the arrows that God has blessed us with in our quiver, uh, God is in this too. And, uh, and I think God wants us to do things in community, and, uh, and we're in a great place. Uh, to be able to do that. And tonight, we wanted to help out by bringing in a couple of ladies. And uh, I am going to open this with a quick word of prayer, and then I'm going to introduce them and let them run with the show. Let's go before the Father. Lord, we love you tonight. And uh, we thank you. We thank you for our children. Scripture says they are a, a reward of the womb. They are a heritage from the Lord. And Father, as we think about our kids right now, each one and how unique they are, uh, Father, we thank you for your fingerprints on them. We thank you for the picture that you have in your mind's eye right now of the man of God, the woman of God, that each of these young people are growing into. And thank you for the privilege that we have to stand with the parents that are in this room as teachers, uh, support staff, administration, board, um, Father, to stand with them and to partner with them and watch their kids grow uh, into, um, um, in, into what you have designed for them. And so, Father, it is with that in view that we uh, bring um, Cheryl and Diane. And, uh, Father, I ask that you would just encourage them and, uh, Father, just enable them to speak as they have prepared and as you have laid on their hearts the words that you would have for us tonight. Um, as we, as parents, school, uh, faith communities, partner together to raise up your heritage. Father, thank you for this evening, and thank you for all who have come. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, <clears throat> so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. I've wasted a lot of time right now. I think the cool thing about both these ladies is who you're going to hear from are women who have had children at Christian schools. Uh, so they've been exactly where you are. They've raised their kids. Their kids are out of the home. They're grown. Diane has been worked at a Christian school, and so she's been a part of the fabric of the school, not only as a parent, wearing that parent cap over the years as her children have grown up. Cheryl has done the same. Uh, but Diane has also worked in a school and has partnered with families. They bro both bring a wealth of expertise, experience. Uh, Cheryl, who I'm going to introduce first, um, is... Um, uh, a psychologist and uh, works with um, individuals, families, um, schools, like she's doing with us tonight, to really help step us through the dynamics of relationship and, uh, and how the Word of God informs that and how we can take that into uh, the areas of our lives and work with our kids. And then uh, Diane <clears throat> um, is a consultant, works with businesses, schools like ours, and uh, really provides um, a great way of teaming and working together and, uh, and, and being able to see how we can, as a team, um, reach our goals and to do that in a way that just really um, has the fingerprints of the Lord on that and just really got, uh, honors God in a neat way. So without any further ado, Cheryl Simmons, would you please come up and share with us? Thank you. 
This is fine, I think. I think this will be fine. If I wander too far, I'll have to come back and see where we are here. Uh, there's a handout at some point, someplace. If you have it, if not, you can have some of these for notes when you leave or um, just however that gets to be handled. But I'm honored to be here, um, very much so. Uh, we are here because of Jake. We love him. He and Karen have both taught our, our children years ago in a Christian school, and you will not hear bigger cheerleaders for a school like yours, not at all. We are honored and want to focus a little bit on the journey of parenthood. Raise, how to raise godly children in an ungodly world. Not an easy task, is it? I will always remember when my firstborn daughter, and this is who Jake and Karen both taught her, and um, she came in at about the age of four years old, and she put one hand on her hip, and the other one is pointing out to me and said, you know, Mom, I've discovered something. I'm like, well, what have you discovered? Thinking, oh my gosh, what, is, what animal is in my house now? But she's, I've discovered, you know, you don't have to teach bad, but you have to teach good. And then it was, I thought, words of wisdom from a four-year-old. She's right. And then what? She's about sixth grade, and in the sixth grade, we're driving home, and this same daughter of mine just says, you know, Mom, I'm just really grateful that our car has dark tinted windows, so no one will see me riding with you. <laughs> and I'm like, well, thank, you know, would you like to walk the rest of the way home, sweetheart? And so it's like this journey of parenthood, it is a roller coaster, isn't it? They're wise, they're sassy, they are embarrassed by you, but the journey then continues, right? It will continue, I promise you will persevere and live through this, that as the journey continued, this same daughter had parents weekend at UT, and we show up, of course, as parents of a freshman, and she's going, Mom, Mom, over here, come here, come here, I want you to meet my friends. And it's like suddenly I was okay. So this up and down, this roller coaster. So the irony of parenthood is if you do your job well and your children are bonded and connected and close to you, then when they get to be teenagers, you're stupid. You, they look at you as stupid. That they what? They, it's their God-given job is to resist you so they can form their own identity. Just as a therapist here, this is the psychological development of identity. So then they have to push away from you. But the interesting thing is, once they're about 19 or 20, we'll have to go at least to 20 or even 24, it's like you get smart again. And they like you again. Any of you have some older ones that maybe you've experienced that? So see, you're going to change. Don't worry about it. Just cling to one another. Cling to the Lord so your own self-esteem during those teen years, and you'll be fine. Let's discuss styles of parenting. One is an authoritarian style. How many of you were raised with, now you need to do this because I said so. How many of you were raised that way? That's authoritarian right there. And the strictest form of authoritative, authoritarian parenting is that authoritarian parents are demanding, they are strict, they're fairly sometimes cold, and there's clear expectations, but there's only one road, and it's the parent's way. My way or the highway? Well, the problem, of course, with that now is, does this work? I mean, how did you feel when your parents may have said, you do this because I said so? Did it make you want to comply? Probably not. It just made me mad. But that's insight into my personality, <laughs> I know. But it not really, but it was the way life was. So power, but in that type of style, when it comes to parenting children, power is the goal. And we, make, we can make power real attractive to our kids. I'm in charge. Authoritarian parents are much more interested in control and power than they are in relationship and connection. So God doesn't really talk about it that way, does he? He doesn't. It's a mutual relationship. Love your children. Do not provoke them to anger. Children, obey your parents. It's a mutuality there. 
Okay, let's talk about a second style, which is permissive parenting. Permissive parents is sort of like watching um, the TV show Downton Abbey. Anybody into Downton Abbey? Oh gosh, don't get me started. It's so fun. It's so wonderful. Hang in there, guys. But anyway, Downton Abbey, only with permissive parenting, the parents live downstairs and the children live in the upstairs. They are the privileged ones. They are the ones who run the kingdom. They are the ones. Permissive parenting has very unclear boundaries, unclear expectations. Permissive parents have a high need for their children to like them, to be happy with them as a person and as a parent. Now, let's be real. We all like our kids to be happy with us, right? I don't like my kids to be upset with me. That doesn't feel good. However, it's just do you have such a high need for your child to like you to where you'll just do whatever it takes. Indulge them. Give them what? The sun, moon, and stars. I've worked with a number of families, tons of them, with children who were raised in this permissive environment. We got way too much of it. We want to help our children, what? Learn the fruits of the Spirit and have some self-control. Permissive parenting style will not teach a child self-control. And even though we think these children will, what, be our best friend and happy, they wind up, usually the ones I've seen in therapy, they're very anxious. Children raised in a permissive, indulged atmosphere become very anxious because they're so protected from having to deal with disappointment that they fear any kind of setback or failure, any disappointment, because they feel fragile. They can't handle it. It's very sad. When God has equipped all of our children to bounce back, to come back, we need to look at what? Failures as setbacks, something we can learn from, but stay in the game, get back up. Keep on what? Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we shall reap if we don't go weary. Don't grow, I can't even say it, well, will we? So if we can just hang in there, and I think, so the third style of parenting that I'd like to throw out to you is this authoritative parenting. That's the new term now, the 21st term, authoritative. It, what it is is balance. I mean, this to me, if you really think about it, is God's word says. It's about balance of love and connection where your kids know they are loved no matter what. My daddy used to tell me that over and over again, and I'm thinking, when is he going to be quiet about that? But now I know why he did. I love you no matter what. There's nothing you'll ever do that'll make me stop loving you. And yet also claiming the God-given authority that you have to set boundaries, to say no, and go, honey, I'm sure you'll learn. I know you're disappointed, but you will feel better soon, and hopefully someday you'll see the benefit in the fact that if you don't come in on time with your curfew, then you're, you need to come in 30 minutes earlier the next night and earn your privilege back, or whatever the consequence is, and they're not protecting them. So that's your authoritative parents. That style of parenting where you indulge your kids less and enjoy them more. It's a real irony, but it takes some courage to do that. Let's talk a little bit about, though, what all children need. You can take this one to the bank, I do believe, and we can teach, you can teach these to your children just in your day in, day out living. I love the scripture in Deuteronomy. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up, just all the time. These are four things that every child needs to succeed in life, to become a self-sufficient, godly young adult. And that's kind of our goal, right? You want them off your payroll eventually. You really do. <laughs> it is a wonderful feeling, isn't it, Diane? It really is. Oh. Okay. Um, the first thing they need, though, is the feelings of worth and value. They need to know who they are, a sense of identity. It's been said when Bill Clinton first started on the campaign trail, he visited a nursing home, and he bent down to this sweet, precious little lady and said, Ma'am, do you know who I am? And she looks up at him and says, No, Sonny, I don't, but if you go over there to that nurse's station, they'll be happy to tell you who you are. <laughs> Your kids need to know who they are. So when you 
say back to them, love them and, and compliment them and praise them for their character qualities, not just for their performance, but for the person they are. You are so much fun. You are so smart. I love how you think. Your creative mind astounds me. I mean, get your key phrases ready to talk about character traits of your child. It's just like putting sticky notes and labels on your child and it makes them feel great. And the fact that you noticed it means you're important to me. Every child needs to know they're important to at least one of their parents. It's ideal if there's two, but it's okay. If you're a single parent, I'm here tonight to tell you, you can do this. All kids need four things, and any parent can do this. But because you're here, it tells me you're going to be the ones that can do it. So that sense of identity. Learn your child's, we've all heard this a lot, but love language. Do they like to be hugged? Some of them don't. You have to sneak it in. Go in the back door, pat them on the shoulder, and walk away. I call it a hit and run. But it's still tactile. Because one thing all human beings need is a place to belong, not to be isolated. We are created to be social creatures. So that goes into the second need that all children need, and that's healthy relationships. They have to have connections. No man can be an island. We're created that way. So it begins, of course, at home with the family. And it's tough these days, I know. And it gets tougher. But I know some families, they'll have a basket there at the, at the kitchen table, and for at least just two or three evenings a week, they have a meal together. You put all the technology and all the I this and I that in the basket and sit down and focus on each other. And, and even talk about what was the craziest thing that happened to you today? What was the best thing that happened? Not ask yes and no questions. Learn to have game night. It sounds hokey. My kids are still what? They're into bananagrams. And, and, and whatever game you can, you know, have your kids play. Here's three, pick one. Some families have a jar. Everybody puts pieces of paper with names of games or activities in. And maybe it's just, if it's once a month, it's hard. But it's just your nuclear family to build that special connections. All children need it. Within the family, you teach conflict resolution. How to sit down and say clearly, unemotionally, that's the ticket, right? That's the key. This is what I would really help. This is what I would like from you. It really bothers the whole family when you leave your stuff everywhere all over the den or they act like a monkey in front of the TV screen, whatever. I mean, this goes with any age child, too. That, you know, what, so would you please not do that? Maybe they need a timeout, a logical consequence or something. I remember the day I set my youngest son free from one of my daughters who was determined to have the last word. Yeah, Osha knows exactly who I'm talking about. That third child of mine, she, she just thought having the last word, whoever said, I don't understand. What is the big deal about the last word? If somebody knows, let me know. Because anyway, but a lot of people feel like they have to have that last word. I taught my youngest, I keep trying to tell them, you know, to have a therapist for a mother, how lucky can you get? No. <laughs> They don't see it that way. Mom, you don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, whatever. You just can't have that high need for all the appreciation to come from your children, right? Yeah. Anywho, um, I taught our youngest, though, to simply agree to disagree. And he just looked at her, and he's, had, he's done it ever since. Because she's still a good girl, still likes the last word. But now nobody cares. And so, <laughs> yeah. Um, so he would look at her and go, I disagree and walk off. It would frustrate the fire out of her. You know, I disagree. And when you learn that skill yourself, you know, I can tell. We just see it different. That's okay. And have, like, you just don't give a rip and you walk off. It's okay. It is very empowering. It will empower you. I know you're not happy with the decision you made and the fact that you're grounded for a month. However, I'm sure you will adjust and be fine. Take care, bye-bye, and walk off. <laughs> I mean, just learn it like you're an actor or an actress. Just do it. And your children, you will indulge them less and enjoy them more. The one thing, another thing that, of course, all children need is a sense of responsibility, accountability. It's the real world, right? 
Our job is to teach them how to function out in the real world. So it's accountability. We love them no matter what, and yet some just let those natural and logical consequences roar. Sometimes, what, if they're late at school, let the school deal with them. <laughs> Maybe you don't even have to fool with that. Um, letting the fact that what, if they don't study, you can try, you can lead the horse to the trough, but you can't make them drink sometimes. And yet, the natural consequences, the grades will take over. Um, but being able to allow them to experience some of those things. Getting ready for that last point though that all kids need is going to be what? A meaningful faith. A faith that what can carry them just in their daily walk. Probably if there was the one, if I had to pick one of these needs, that'd be the one I'd really want to focus on. That they feel, they know that God loves them no matter what. It's interesting. It almost is incentive for them to follow God's word, even more so. But to establish a meaningful faith, be able to share, though, some of how God has revealed himself to you. When I was 16, my real, a real close, close friend of mine that I grew up with was instantly killed in a car crash. I thought my life would end. And I was able to share with my children that, you know what, if you have a big loss in your life, God created your heart to heal. And you will feel better, even though you think you're just shattered in a million pieces. But you'll feel better because God did that for me. And I can talk to you now about Jenny. And I know she's in heaven and I'll see her again. And your heart heals while you now you have the hope of seeing her again. And, you know, my kids at the time, they're not like, oh, wow, Mom, thanks for telling me. No, no, no. I mean, I really do have good kids. I make them sound like they're terrible. But, but they're, you know, they're just kind of going to go, uh, okay, okay. Well, now that they're older, that's going to come back. Those are seeds you plant. So share what God has done, how God brought you together with their, with their mother or their dad. This is God has a plan, and I know he has a plan for you. And share with your kids they, lo they, they are listening to you more maybe than they'll give you credit for. If they're, if they're young, they'll listen to you if they're older. And you know what? Take them to church. Find a good church. Find one. That, and so they can know the saving grace of Jesus and have Jesus in their hearts. You know, I knew I finally had a church kid when one of them came in one day and go, was like, where's my Snickers? Because when you have a big family, four kids, if you want anything precious, you better have a, a place you hide it. Well, someone had found, you know, her stash. So she came in there and was like, where's my Snickers? And the guilty party always speaks up first. That's why you have to find out who did it. So my youngest, my John, is like, Jesus ate it. <laughs> and I thought, well, now we know who the guilty party is. But I thought, is that in a Christian cop-out? I don't know what it is. Jesus ate it. And I thought, take your kids to church. And if I had one thing to say, keep them in this school till they graduate. My children now as adults, every one of them have thanked me and my husband for sending them to a private Christian school. They say we know the value of long-term Christian friends and their closest friends are from their Christian school that they went to. And they still remain close today, even if they live across the country. And as life gets hard, who do they turn to? Their strong Christian friends from their Christian private school they grew up in. Keep them here. You will not regret it. And they didn't pay me to say that. Yeah. Um, so having that meaningful faith is so important. So give your kids that love, self-esteem. Give them healthy relationships. Connect with them like crazy. Show them right from wrong. Hold them accountable. Don't be afraid to give them consequences. It will come back to help them and you later on. Save you a boatload of heartache. And them too. And then talk about that meaningful faith. My oldest got his driver's license, of course, at 16. The big deal, right? And he earned the privilege of taking the car to a football game. And he earned it by having to take his sister with him. So, yeah, it's great. You do, you'll drive even less when you get the oldest one to take the younger ones driving. And they'll do anything for a while to drive that car. So he took the phone. They're leaving the football game about 1030. And we live, what, maybe 20, 30 minutes from the school. So they, we said, we'll meet you at home. It was 30 minutes, 
40 minutes, almost an hour later, and he had accidentally turned right instead of left on the freeway and wound up way north Houston past Intercontinental Airport, crazy, where we live near the Galleria. And this is a day and age before cell phones, so he's wandering around. His sister is on her 10 ear screaming, pull over, we gotta figure out where we are, and no offense, but he's a guy, so he wouldn't ask for directions. So anyway, bottom line is, about a quarter of 12, they pull in a convenience store somewhere way out in the boonies of North Houston and call home. Their dad answers the phone. He's like, where are you? Don't move. Warren gets in his truck, he drives all the way out, and they were scared, they were hungry, they were out of gas, it was a bad scene. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to be there. But he put gas in their car, he fed them, he reassured them, he comforted them, and he looked at them and he just said, follow me, follow me home. My prayer is that your children will feel loved by you to the point that they will call upon their heavenly father and when they call unto him they will know he will answer them and show them great and mighty things they have never known and they will follow him home to introduce we're going to keep this night moving to introduce this my our your next speaker tonight I first have to share with you, I have learned a lot about cows lately. Cows, I moved to the country from Houston. It's quite a change. But anyway, we'll talk about that another time. Cows, though, are like kids. Cows are like kids. They're curious. They have no boundaries unless you put up a fence. And each one of them have different personalities. I didn't know any of that about cows. Different personalities. There is no one finer or more skilled at helping you understand your child's personality than my good friend Diane Van Zant. I give you, she is my encourager, she's my partner in crime and my soulmate for over 50 years, Diane Van Zant. Thank you. It's such a privilege to be with you. I had the privilege of working with Jake and when you work with Jake you laugh a lot, a lot. And he, you, I just, I just want to tell you uh, probably already you already know you are so fortunate to have him and he is a gift to whomever he's working with um, <clears throat> you know if there's anything harder than parenting I just haven't met it yet and I remember my late husband was trying to explain something to our junior high daughter and he really thought he was getting through and, and she was looking at him in the eyes, and he was looking at her, and he just thought, I am nailing this sucker. This is good. I am, she will remember this. And all at once, she just kind of leaned over the table, and she looked at him and said, Dad, he went, uh-huh, do you always put pepper on your macaroni? <laughs> and he just looked at me and went, oh, gosh. You know, sometimes you look around the breakfast table, and you go, who are these people? And where did they come from? And it's your family. And you just think, I don't know how to relate to this person. They're so different than I am. And you know, I ran across something about 20 years ago. And my late husband used to write software. And he was writing some software for this company. And <clears throat> he came home and he said, Diane, you would really like this. And I said, oh, well, good. He said, no, Diane, you'd really like this. And um, he brought some of these, they, back then the questionnaires were on paper, and he said, you know, they gave us these questionnaires. I said, Bill, we've been married over 30 years. We know each other. I don't want to fill anything out. He said, no, it's free. And I went, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and so <clears throat> we filled it out real quick, and I, I thought these are the dumbest questions I have ever been asked in my life. Finished it like in 25 minutes. Well, I got it back, and it was like somebody sat in my living room and just, just observed, and I got it back. That report was called the Berkman. I've been using that as my tool for about 20 years now. Dr. Berkman was a tremendous man. He was a strong, strong Christian. He wanted Berkman to be used for mission work, for schools, for churches, but he couldn't make a living out of it. And so finally it went worldwide. Dr. Berkman was about this tall. And he was a World War II fighter pilot. And he said, you know, we'd fly out 
and would all see, see the same target but would come back and tell a different story. He said, how can we all be looking at the same thing and tell a different story? And that's how this personality assessment was born. And Dr. Berkman says basically that we have a certain DNA in us. He said, God just put it in us. And it's how we see the world. And he said, we're either going to have a blue, green, yellow, or red lens in our eye. And the best way I can explain it, let's say you and your family are going to go on a car trip. You go to the garage and there's a flat tire. The green lens person comes in and says, oh my, flat tire. Mm, well, I need to talk to everybody. Tell me what's on your agenda. Talk to me. I want to see you. I want to see your eyes. That's green. Yellow comes in and says, oh, flat tire. Mm, well, I have a plan. Number one, number two, number three, follow my plan. One, two, three. Y'all are going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Red says, I have the trunk open. I have the jack out. Y'all can talk and plan all you want, but in, you know, 15 minutes, we're out of here. Blue comes down. Last one. I was in my room. Kind of felt it in my heart, like it's going to be a bad day. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, bad day right here in the garage. I felt it in my room upstairs. Do y'all feel it? Y'all feel it? Okay. Same event but a really different outlook on it. So, let's put the family together. Mm. And so, blue, let's talk about blues. I love blues. Blues, feel it first. Feel it first. If you wanna make a blue happy, you say, what are you thinking? What you thinking? What do you think about that? That's a blue. Blue has six ideas before lunch. No big deal. They can decide. And they love to tell you about them. They can tell you and tell you and tell you about them. Green, what about green? Green is the people person. Green is the person that says, you know, I had somebody over for the weekend and that was so much fun, who's next? And somebody says, well, we just had somebody over and they say, I know, but who's next? And they want somebody else, that's green. Green, green can sell. Green can talk you into stuff that you never thought you'd be talked into. And then we have red. Red is the personality that asks questions similar to this. How could you do something so stupid? Now, how do you answer that one? Well, I don't know. I worked real hard at it. I mean, how do you do that? That's red. Red is the get it done. Red is the get it done. I did not come here to play. I came here to get it done. So let's do it. No coffee? No. Let's do it. Red. To the point. Mm. That's the one in the trunk, remember? All right, and then we have yellow. Yellow says there needs to be a system. There must be a system. Uh, and it really, my system is really good. And if we just do one, two, three, we're all going to be fine. So yellow says I have a system, and I would really prefer if everybody follow my system because it's good. It's good. Now then, Put this together in a family. And let's say that we've got a really yellow little boy. And he is so happy because he has one friend. And his friend's name is John. And he loves John. Now his mother, opposite quadrant, is green. She has 76 best friends. <laughs> 76, yeah. She could name them in alphabetical order. And so she says, who would you like to have over this weekend to her little yellow boy? And he says, John. And she says, you had him last weekend. And he said, I know. Isn't that good? And she said, but wouldn't you like to branch out? Wouldn't you like to branch? And she's a brancher. And all at once, little yellow thinks, what's wrong with me that I'm not branching? My mama branches, and I just like John. And so she asks again. Now, after I've told you about branching, wouldn't you really prefer to have somebody other than John? And little yellow sits there and goes, not really, I really like John. And so green mom can make little yellow boy feel like a weirdo because he has one good friend. And so more and more, He's feeling a little bit strange because he's not what? Like mom. Like mom. 
And so as we look at our personality types and we look at this, do you know God did not make a mistake putting who he put in your family? He knew you as parents. You know, Cheryl nailed it right here. She said, keep your kids in a Christian. I didn't even mean to do that, but that was kind of good because I really mean this point. <laughs> keep your kids in Christian school. I was director of admissions at second about 20 years. And nothing would drive me any crazier than somebody coming in saying, my 12-year-old is going to make the choice of where she goes to school. I remember when, when I was testing and had a first grader that said, well, I'm deciding whether to come here or another school. And I said, you'll love that other school. <laughs> We're not going there. Mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. Honey, you will love that school. I've been there. You'll enjoy it. So no one... No one who is 14 years old needs to decide where they're going to school. Are you kidding me? They make decisions like this. How many water fountains do they have? Stuff like that. (laughs) And you just go, and when parents would come in and say, well, my child is making this decision, I just go, really? Really? How many years have they been on this earth? Well, I don't think that's enough. Let's rethink that. Now then, so as you are... <clears throat> between Cheryl and I, we have 17 grandchildren. We have a tribe between <laughs> us. And each one of our grandchildren has a different personality, a different personality. And so as our children get older, and now they are parents, they are appreciating that Christian school more than they ever have. You know, I have a daughter who's my oldest, and she has a lot of blue in her. She has a lot of green in her. And um, so when she was getting ready to go to high school, she announced, she said, I believe I'm not going to Second Baptist anymore. I said, oh, where are you going? And she said, well, she said, I believe I'll go to St. Agnes. That's where our neighbor was going. She had never been to that school. I said, well, how do you know anything about it? And she said, well, I don't, but I believe I'll go there. And so I thought, "Uh uh-huh. Well, I worked at the school. She told everybody at school she's going to St. Agnes. (laughs) And so my younger daughter, who's kind of an old soul, do you have one that's born about 40? Well, she was born 40. And so she came to me and she said, when are you going to tell her no? And I said, I said, at the right time. And so Bill was out of town. And so we were sitting at the table eating. And she said, oh, she said, you wouldn't get the same discount, would you, if I went to St. Agnes? And I went, no. She said, so we can't afford for me to go to that school? And I said, no. And she said, so I'm not going, am I? I went, no. (laughs) And my younger daughter just went, why didn't you tell her that sooner? And I said, I was waiting for the right time. And I said, honey, this is where you need to be, and you're going to be here. It is imperative, no matter what personality our children have, to have those boundaries like Cheryl was talking about. There's nothing that could drive a 14-year-old any crazier than to think that she's in charge of her home. Are you kidding me? That makes for major insecurity, major insecurity. Now then, on the Berkman, and I have a handout for you. On the Berkman, we talked about the four quadrants. The blue, the green, the red, the yellow. So the different personalities, and you can think of your children. You know, when God made our children, he did not make a a cookie-cutter child. There's not going to be another one like them. They have their own personality, their own way of doing things, their own way of thinking, and they're opposite many times of their siblings, which they should be, which they should be. How do we celebrate those differences How do we celebrate those differences? Now then, on Berkman, it talks about an asterisk. And they have John Q. Public on your handout. And on the asterisk, it's just what we love to do. We do it for free. And it may be in the, in the blue, which says, I love creating things. It may be in the, in, did I say blue? Yeah, blue. And it may be in the green, which says, I love being with people. Maybe in the red, which says, I love getting that task done. Just give me a job, give me a list, let me check it off. Ah, Got it. It may be yellow that says, I'm going to organize this. I love yellows, I don't have a speck of yellow in me. And so I love yellows, I hire yellows, this is good. 
Now then, and that's just what we love to do. And we all have something. I had a client that came and threw his report on my desk and he said, Diane, I've got a good business. He said, I've been doing it 25 years. I just happen to hate it. He said, show me anything else I can do. I said, sit down. We'll do it. We'll do it. We were made in a certain way to accomplish certain things for the kingdom of God. And so if we look at our children that way, and we see maybe a real strong will, maybe just one that is almost unbending. God did that. God did that. Put that person in the kingdom work, maybe a businessman, maybe a teacher, whatever. That strong will standing for the will of God, that's going to make a difference in this world. So be very careful as you pray for your children. Don't take away the gifts that God has given them for purpose. But man, is it hard to parent at times. Whoa! Now then, <clears throat> look at the diamond on there. The diamond is John Public on a good day. And it's what we look like on a good day, and it's observable behavior. If that diamond's in the blue, the diamond says you're insightful, and you're thoughtful, and you're optimistic, and you're socially selective. Don't you like that? Socially selective. That's so if you have one or two friends, you'll have them real close in your heart. And in the green, if that diamond's in the green, that says that people see you as friendly. They see you as having a competitive edge. They see you as drawing other people in. If you have a diamond in the red, you're friendly. You get the job done. You're energetic. The diamond in the yellow says that if you have the diamond there, people see you as faithful, loyal, on the spot. Okay? Most personality assessments stop right here. This is why I love Berkman, this one symbol. It's a circle with a square around it. And this is what, Dr. Berkman was a wonderful believer. He got shot down over enemy lines in World War II. And a family hid him. He said literally he could see the Nazis boots in the grass. And a family hid him for several months. And he made it out of there. Dr. Berkman says he feels like this part, literally, God just whispered in his ear. The circle says, what do you need from other people? In other words, how do you need to be treated? There's a certain way, if we treat one of our children one way, it's perfect. If we treat another child that exact same way, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so needs are not needy, but it's how we need to be treated, how we like to be treated. And boy, is that the gift that you want to know. That's the secret. That's getting into that child's soul. And as Christian parents, we want in our child's soul. We want them to know Jesus. We want them to be influenced by that. And the world right now is insane. It's insane. And if we do not teach this, and we can't get into the souls of our children, they're lost. They're lost. And that's the last thing we want. You wouldn't be sitting here on a Thursday night if you didn't care. We want into the souls of our children. So, let's talk about needs. Blue needs. <clears throat> Remember they're the feelers? Remember there was the one in the room came down and said, I thought it was going to be a bad day? Okay, blue needs. These are the tender people of the world, creative people of the world. Blue needs says, just understand me. You're going to be nice. I'm going to be nice. Nice, nice. Nice works. I like nice. Nice, nice. That's blue. Blue need. Green need. Green need says, tell me clearly what you want, and then leave me alone. Let me do it. Don't breathe down my neck. I can't tell you the numbers of my young clients that look at their mothers after I say this and go, uh-huh. Did you hear that? Yeah. That's green need. Red Need says, please don't tell me a story. Just email me. I, I'll do it, but, but if you won't tell me a story, I'll do it sooner. Please. My late husband used to go like this. He used to go. And it used to hurt my feelings until we'd been married about 30 years. And he, he, he'd go like this, and that meant wrap it up. Wrap it up. Get to the bottom right there. And so Red Need, Yellow Need. Yellow Need says... Tell it to me straight, what you want, and then don't change your mind. 
Don't move the target 10 feet. Don't think it's funny. Don't like it. Uh uh. Uh uh. Yellow. That's yellow. Now, see, there's a square around that circle. It's always around the circle. The square is our stress behavior. It happens when our needs aren't met. Next time your family's falling apart, and all families do, next time your family's just falling apart, somebody's just having a jackrabbit fit, think this question. What need's not getting met here? What need is not getting met? When they're little, it could be a nap. Sometimes when they're big, it could be. Sometimes we need a nap. So it can be something like that. But blue stress looks like this. Blue stress, and, and think of a terrible day. Blue stress is like a spiral. It's like it is 9 in the morning, and it is like a bad day. By noon, it will be worse. And by 3 o'clock, just zip up the body bag because it is over. <laughs> That's blue. Blue stress is quiet. People have to know you intimately probably to know you're in stress. Green stress. Green stress is argumentative. Sounds kind of like this. Excuse me, I have tried it that way. I am not doing it that way again. Read my lips. Nope. Nope. Red stress is, I'm just going to ball you out, and then, whoa, don't we feel better? You want to go to lunch? That's red stress. When red stress rains on blue stress, ooh, blue says, I wouldn't go to lunch with you if you're the last person on the face of the earth. Red stress, blue stress. Yellow stress. Yellow stress says, you can say what you want, do what you want, but when you shut the door, I'm going to do what I want. <laughs> so just keep on talking. As soon as you're gone, it's over. Now, any of that ring a bell in your family? Mm, yeah. Tough parenting. So what I want you to do is, I want you to ask the question when things are falling apart, what need is not being met here? Not being met. Um, my husband, five years ago, went outside to jog, and he died in one hour. Just died. And I'd been married 40 years. My whole life just did a 180. 180. But something really good. Before he died, at second, uh, in the senior year, the parents write their seniors a letter. And this was written by my husband to my oldest daughter. And I just want to share a few sentences. This was written on September 7th, 1993. This was written to Marilyn. And it says, <clears throat> year by year, with the population of the world soaring, it can be discouraging because you think that to be successful, you must be one in a million leader. You must be famous. The result, of course, is give up before you even try anything. Don't fall for that. You're important. Remember Christ died for you. Don't feel you are the only worthwhile if you, if you win. <clears throat> Just walk humbly with your Lord. Don't equate your life with an achievement. Don't focus on the destination as much as the journey. There is nothing more significant in God's eyes than small acts of faithfulness. Now, if you were removed from this earth tonight, tonight, would your children know what's really important to you and important to them? Your children are the most precious assets you have. And you were given these as a gift, as a loan. Make sure, make sure that your children know what's important to you. Thank you for coming. This gives you a little preview of something I'd like to do with every one of our senior students. I would like to do the Bertman profile with them because it is so insightful and it gives parents a tool to counsel their children what college to go to, what occupation you might be interested in, because a lot more information than what Diane shared is incorporated into the Bertman. And I knew that the day that I took the Bertman and she was going to go over all our profiles with the entire staff. And when I read my profile, I was just aghast. I just went, she's going to share this with everyone. <laughs> and I'm telling you, she did go over it, my profile with the staff, as she did the other staff members with me. But it was like standing there with no clothes on, 
while someone's talking about you. And I remember one comment she said, she said, Jake really likes order. He's the kind of guy who will spit in the sink so he can clean it again. <laughs> well, I didn't think that was very charitable. I mean, it sounded really OCD, you know, but it was true and the other employees were laughing. And, uh, but it gives you such insight into your children, into your coworkers, into your spouse. Karen and I had ours done with a, a spousal relationship and they give you a little cross-reference of how you interact on certain things. I knew I was right <laughs> all along and the test proved it, I was right. Karen doesn't clean the house right. I clean it the proper way. But it gives you such insight. And to do this with our seniors is going to be a great tool for the parents and for the kids themselves to take a look at their gifts and the way they operate, how they respond to authority, how they respond to requests, what their stress reactions are. They can learn to start identifying when you start shifting from your normal mode of operation and you start making that shift into your stress reaction. You can learn to identify it early. You can stop it. But it takes a lot of practice and it takes some insight. So that's just a little preview of what we're doing. Now, it's a school night. We all have things to do. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate you. Uh, if you have questions, Diane and Cheryl are going to stay. And they'll be glad to answer any questions you have. But I'd like to close this in prayer right now. Pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we have together. We love you so much. Thank you for your loving kindness and goodness to us. Thank you for these families in the room and the children they represent. And Lord, help us to be good stewards. Bless the efforts we make, however inadequate they may be, so that our children can grow up to fulfill everything you have for them in their lives. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.